we wait here just for a moment while uh, everyone joins us. Right. Well, um, when I think on the bottle of guests, I croiso a marioneth. Um, ladies and gentlemen, welcome from uh, Wales, um, the southern edge of uh, Marioneth, where I am sitting, as the dying embers of the day sort of cast a silver light over the middle of the Dubby Valley, which is what I'm looking out over. I'm absolutely delighted to be joined on this um, seminar uh, by a group of experts, um, uh, all of whom have experience of selling whales in one way or another. Um, and I'm absolutely, I'm going to just introduce them very quickly. We've got Vera Lott, who um, is a director from the Tour Partner Group. Uh, Vera, do you, do you want to say hello very quickly? Hello, everyone. Um, I'm Vera. I'm based in the UK. Um, and I'm working for Tour Partner Group, so we are, and I'm looking after everything that's marketing, people, and CSR related. We are an in inbound DMC, and I've been working with Claire for years already now and her team around the world. Um, we sell to over 40 source markets, predominantly B2B, and um, yeah, I'm very happy and delighted to be here today. Thank you. And I also say very, very kindly has stepped in at the last minute because Karen Urban, who has advertised is taking part in this uh, uh, in this webinar has unfortunately contracted COVID in um, in Bavaria. Whether this is the currently fashionable Omicron strain or some Bavarian variant, we don't know. But she's not very well, and we really do wish her all the best. Particularly if you're watching at the moment, um, Karen, she may indeed be watching. Um, Adam, please introduce yourself. Yeah, good uh, afternoon, everyone. My name is Adam Lottinger. Um, I've just very recently retired uh, from Mickey Travel uh, after 39 years with the company. Uh, most of that in London, but five of those years also in Japan. Uh, Mickey Travel sort of specializes in both group and FIT. Uh, and of course, as part of UK, Wales was one of the destinations that we have promoted over the years and, and tried to sell. Uh, my personal background particularly was in, in the hotel side for many years, um, but most latterly uh, I was a director on the board and ultimately the managing director. Um, recently retired at the end of July, as I said. So, thank you. Yes. I, I think I would stress that uh, Mickey are one of the giants of European wholesale travel, um, and they have a huge footprint um, in Asia, particularly in Japan. Uh, it's great to have you here, and thank you for breaking cover, um, uh, Adam, in such a My fashion. pleasure. Uh, our partner in this enterprise and in uh, the Britain and Ireland marketplace, which is this is this this event is partly to promote, is of course Joss Croft. Say hello, Joss. Hello, everyone. Uh, yes, I'm Joss. Uh, I'm the chief executive of UK Inbound, a trade association uh, that represents the interests of 300 businesses involved in selling the UK internationally. Um, we work very closely with Visit Wales. Uh, we also work very closely with the uh, partners on the call today, be that Tom through Britain and Ireland Marketplace, many other lobbying activities, or whether it be with Vera or Adam uh, in terms of Miki and Tour Partner Group as well. Uh, prior to work at UK Inbound, uh, I was the marketing director at Visit Britain. Um, and obviously Wales formed a really important part of that portfolio uh, and I've worked with Claire uh, and others on the call over many years uh, trying to get the destination onto must-see shortlists for any international arrival into the UK. So delighted to be here. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, Charles. And Claire, um, I, I doubt if you need too much introduction to the current audience, but please introduce yourself. <laughs> Um, um, good afternoon, everybody. Lovely to see so many people on this afternoon. Um, so I'm Claire Dwight from Visit Wales. I lead the uh, team that's responsible really for business to business marketing, particularly with the leisure travel trade. And, um, you know, it's it's great to have the opportunity to work with 
our partners, Itawa and UK Inbound, as well as um, inbound operators to sort of discuss really the opportunities that exist now for uh, international into Wales. Thank you. Um, I've, we've prepared a short sort of statistical um, rundown um, put together by um, David Edwards, formerly of Visit Britain, now of ETOA. Um, and I will just uh, try and share my screen very quickly to um, give you a quick insight as to what um, he has to say. Um, I don't know, can you see that at the moment? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right, um, just very briefly, um, David very kindly put this together. Uh, the, the figures here um, obviously uh, largely come from Visit Britain um, uh, and the International Passenger Survey. I, um, sometimes they're, they're open to question, but I think the general thrust of it is perfectly, perfectly solid. Um, he, we're looking very much at what, what the shape of inbound, that's very much foreign visitors coming to Wales, how many there, how many there are and how many um, and what they do. And you'll see that the uh, overnight inbound tourism to Wales in 2019 um, really was responsible for, uh, you know, the best part of half a billion pounds worth of spending. And that is, you know, a very significant sum of money nothing like as big as the um, uh, spend by uh, domestic visitors in Wales, those people coming in from England chiefly, nevertheless, um, you know, represents um, nearly uh, two million nights and um, the best part of uh, uh, 400,000 uh, visits just on the leisure side. Um, if you then look at uh, what the pattern of this has been in terms of uh, visits and spend, over the last year, as you see, it's been consistently rising. There was a dip in, in 2017, which was recovered from um, in 2019. But they, um, uh, what we don't have, of course, is the, the subsequent um, real, really crash that's occurred in inbound tourism in 20, uh, 2020 and 2021. Um, if you look at what the most important markets are, Unsurprisingly, um, Ireland uh, features extremely strongly, not least because um, two of the most important ferry routes coming from Ireland into the United Kingdom uh, go through Wales. Um, and I think you'll also find, if you look at the USA uh, figures, that a large proportion of the USA um, volume is slightly hypothecated around, though Claire may wish to correct me on this if I'm wrong, is slightly hypothecated around the fact that many Americans are traveling through Wales uh, either to get to or from Fish Garden Hollyhead uh, and the two great corridors running on, along the south, south and north of the country are largely responsible for, for the big figures that you see in the first two chunks. Um, uh, the good news is that Vera is here also to tell us about Germany in a second so to a certain extent we have these uh, markets two and three covered. Um, Source markets mix in regional England just to see how, you know, is there any difference uh, to what happens in Wales to the rest of England? The answer is in terms of mix, there's very little difference. I mean, you, you'll see that uh, regional England gets about sort of 10% uh, of its volume from the Asia, Asia Pacific. Uh, you get 12%, which is in some ways surprising, um, but broadly, um, you know, 70% of, of the traffic comes from Europe. Um, and Broadly, 13% of the traffic comes from North America. Um, the only big difference here, and it is obviously very significant, is that the volume of people going to regional England and Wales um, is remarkably different. I mean, I think there are probably 17 times the number of people going uh, to regional England than there are to Wales. Um, but to put that in context, um, uh, the population of regional England is probably 15 times that of, um, of Wales. So um, it's not surprising that there's this huge disparity in volumes. Uh, the top towns, uh, I think you probably don't need to be told this, but you'll see that a lot of what um, drives um, this is availability of accommodation, and the accommodation is largely predicated um, on the, um, uh, the existence of um, uh, business and uh, business hotels for 
uh, leisure tourists to, to, to stay in. Um, but again, I don't think anybody would be surprised by this huge over preponderance of Cardiff, but the card has most of the hotel room. And that's it from me. Now, um, Claire, you've got a few things um, to say. Um, can I transition into your presentation? Yes, please, if you're able to uh, bring that onto the screen, Tom. I'll do what I can. I, can you see that? Yeah, Is if you're able. Yeah. Yes, that's great. Thanks, Tom. Well, um, well tell me when I'm you're Okay, so I'm going to um, follow on from the research slides which Tom has run through with a few more general insights in a moment. Um, to start with though, um, Tom, ne next slide, please. Um, I just wanted to home in a bit more on the travel trade, which is clearly really important for Wales to generate inbound tourism. We know that at least 35.8 million uh, was generated for the Welsh economy in 2019 from a sample of uh, circa 850 domestic and international tour operators. Uh, next, please, Tom. And this summary from that annual travel trade research, um, which some on the call have kindly contributed to, shows, um, particularly with the arrows in the bottom left hand of the screen, um, shows a tracker group of 100 operators that significantly increased the spend and bed nights um, to Wales between 2010 and 2019. Um, and from the overall sample, um, which this is, shows sort of general highlights, North Wales and Cardiff have proved most popular with fairly equal spread across the, the rest of Wales in, in terms of visits. Next, please, John. Um, I also want to briefly mention the strategic context now uh, before we go on to some further insights. Um, we launched a strategy just before COVID really hit, and that still provides a clear sense of direction for the longer term uh, for Wales. Uh, next. In the meantime, uh, we published a recovery plan uh, back in March, and um, that really will sort of provide a bridge back to our strategic plan. Within it is the ambition to bring back international visitors to pre-COVID levels within at least two years, um, with actions being taken to undertake and, and support the return of, of inbound business. Next. So three S's underpin our strategic approach, which is focused on extending the season, increasing spend and spread. Uh, next, please, Tom. And next again. So Tom showed some um, figures. Um, if you can go, just go back one, Tom. Um, yeah. Well, you'd be on my, oh, sorry. Let's see if I can. Oh, yes. Oh, that's it. Hold on. Yeah. Well, OK. Well, um, yeah. So um, Tom showed the 2019 um, figures and, and you, you did reference, Tom, the um, there are obviously because of the, the sample sizes for, um, you know, Wales in particular and the low base sizes, we, we do have to consider whether the IPS data is, you know, is subject to a bit lower reliability than we'd like. So what we tend to do is um, we use three year averages to interpret the longer term trends. So this is actually the three years in the run up to um, the pandemic, um, but it does mirror really Tom's slide in terms of, of markets by, by trips. Um, next please, Tom. 
But um, when you look at the spend, um, so this is the markets that are both in the top 10 for visits and for spend. Um, so it, it shows the highest spend market uh, pre-COVID. And, you know, I mean, as Tom says, obviously some of that traffic is passing through, but this is spend that is believed to have come into Wales as part of that. So it shows, you know, the significance really for us of, of the US market in particular. Uh, next, please. So um, we've worked with Visit Britain, Scotland and London to commission this inbound sentiment uh, tracker with consumers um, throughout COVID. And um, I just wanted to go through a few of the key points. Um, these are from the latest set of um, published data, which was um, does date back to September. So obviously, you know, doesn't reflect the absolute current um, situation, but um, it gives an in idea of, um, you know, direction of travel and interest. So in terms of um, age groups, the interest in Wales is um, fairly more evenly spread across age groups compared to some of the other nations. And we know that potential visitors to Wales are more likely to have previously visited Britain several times. Um, next, please, Tom. Um, there's a high level of interest for all destination types among Wales potential visitors that possibly reflects the lower of awareness of, of what Wales offers, but we do think it's a good opportunity to really promote exploring different aspects of the country. Next. Um, so travelling with a spouse or partner is the most popular option across all the nations. However, Wales records a stronger interest amongst families with children and travelling alone or with friends are also substantial segments um, of potential visitors. Next. Those wishing to visit Britain and Wales are still considering a range of accommodation experiences, including hotel chains and boutique properties, but also B&Bs, historic houses and private rentals. Uh, next, please. And those interested in visiting Wales are more likely to be interested in history and heritage, outdoor nature, experiencing local life, self-driving and um, guided tours, outdoor activities and sports. Next, Tom, please. So, Diolch, thank you. Um, that's it from me just for now, but I'm going to hand you over to Joss Croft from UK Inbound. Thank you very much, Claire, um, and good afternoon to everyone. So, quick update from me, uh, just in terms of where we are. Um, so, actually, September and October, I think there was a growing confidence in amongst uh, a lot of my members in terms of what 2022 was going to look like. Um, and there was strong demand. Of course, these were only inquiries. There weren't firm bookings at that point. But as we approached um, uh, the back end of November, we'd had a very busy world travel market uh, and obviously Visit Wales um, uh, uh, um, also uh, participating with us and through us on that one as well. Um, but I think it's, uh, it's really when we started to hit news of Omicron that we really started to get an additional shudder through the travel industry. So on the 26th of November, uh, we had uh, the red list uh, where we had six countries added to the UK's red list. Um, and then an additional five were added to that pretty shortly. That meant effectively that people from those 11 countries could not travel to the UK. Um, and then on the 30th of uh, November, uh, we had the announcement that the government was going to implement a PCR tests. These are the 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 uh, tests that allow you to identify the strain of the variant, but that everyone would have to take a PCR test, no matter which market they were coming from, um, on or before day two. And it really was at that point that the uh, tap was turned off because uh, a, a real worry for people that they were going to get stuck in market 
and of course the cost and hassle we may hear a little bit more uh, from other our other two speakers on that later on and then from the 7th of december anyone traveling to the uk also needed that pre-departure test as well that could be a lateral flow or a pcr but it needed to be taken before people arrived now these uh restrictions have as i say they have very much turned off the tap the reason why the day two was put into place by all four nations of the uk was to prevent brits from being stuck overseas but of course that applies to international visitors who would be stuck in the UK. So that day two PCR test is a real issue for us. The next date for the uh, next review is actually tomorrow uh, when those restrictions are due to be re reviewed by the UK government. Uh, it tends to be that the uh, all four nations do adopt a similar approach in terms of border restrictions. So I'm imagining that whatever happens tomorrow will also apply to Wales. Uh, I have to say that I don't think anyone is anticipating, particularly with the rise of Omicron in amongst the UK uh, community transmission population, that we're going to see any changes whatsoever tomorrow. However, the next review date is the 5th of January. And I think we're a little bit more positive that we may hear news of the removal of some of those restrictions, given that a lot of the restrictions were to halt the entrance of Omicron into the UK. And as the WHO would tell you, uh, hard borders don't stop, uh, uh, doesn't stop the transmission into a country. So now there is no reason uh, for us to be doing the PCR test on day two now that there is uh, such high community transmission within the UK. It was desperately unfortunate, as I say, because 86% um, of my members have received cancellations uh, following that news uh, in late November. Uh, and we really need to see some of these restrictions removed on the 5th of January so that we can then start to look for the key booking periods of January to March, given that uh, half of all visitors uh, traveling to the UK think about their trip six months in advance. So they need to be sure that they will be able to come here without some of those restrictions. As I say, it's massively disappointing given that there is still a lot of demand out there. Uh, and again, we'll hear from our other speakers, but people are still very, very keen to travel to the UK. But it is these restrictions and indeed some of the reporting of the case numbers in the UK, the removal of ID cards and various other challenges. But there is still strong demand to travel to the UK. So we were making cases to be made um, about uh, the restrictions needing to be lifted. Um, obviously, the Wales government um, uh, have recently announced uh, a fund and the Scottish government again today uh, announced a further fund. And we're waiting for the UK government uh, to put its hand in its pocket for some of the England based operators who will need that support to get them through until uh, the main season as well. It's also worth just touching for a second around why um, the travel trade are so important. 62% of all the people that come to the UK use a tour operator of some sort or other. That might be an online travel agent, that might be a more traditional operator as well. We know that 77% of people coming from China, uh, over 50% from Germany and over 50% from the USA are traveling to the UK using a tour operator. And we also did a study uh, that looked at, uh, we got responses back from 92 of our tour operators and they carry 11 million visitors to the UK. So roughly one in every four of the passengers that arrives in the United Kingdom, and I would imagine for Wales it would be stronger actually, is booked through the DMCs. So I'm gonna pass it back to Tom now uh, and maybe we can hear from some of those DMCs that are bringing in, as I say, roughly 25% of all the people that travel to the United Kingdom as well. So, Tom, over to you. I hope that's useful for everyone. Thank you, Charles. Um, indeed. <clears throat> Look, uh, we've um, uh, we've got these two people here. I, I think we really need to start hearing from them. And I would just like to ask, um, really, Vera, to start off with. Um, and I appreciate you've got you know huge experience both in. Uh, Germany, which I suppose must still be your principal market, but also United States. Uh, what you know, what experience have you got of selling Wales, and what was popular, 
Um, how did you go about it? I mean, you almost tell us what you do, I suppose. Well, thank you, um, both of you. I mean, just for the intro as well, what we do and how important we are for the industry. Um, I, I think for us, I mean, it's not only US and Germany, it's also uh, France, the Netherlands, um, Italy, Spain. Um, I mean, we operate in uh, or we work with over 40 source markets. And um, I mean, Claire and I uh, have been working for the last five years very closely together and also her team. I mean, Stephen in the US, for example, um, and the team in Germany. Um, and I remember very fondly that Joss uh, and I took a car with Stephen together um, at a Vail to a Wales conference and we drove from Cardiff to uh, Landudno. And I have to say, it, what a beautiful, wonderful country it is. Um, and I think, yes, we have sold um, and promoted Wales in the past. I think the biggest challenge has been that, I mean, Wales has been focusing a lot on domestic travel and not really been shouting out in the world a lot about what it has to offer and what beauty is out there. Um, and as Tom, you mentioned it earlier, um, I mean, you see that the north of Wales and the Cardiff area are very much populated or have the most tourists when it comes to it. Um, and that's related to accommodation as well. So what we have seen in the past, um, we have seen mainly Wales being part of a combination tour. So whether some groups have come or individual travelers have come from the southwest of England and then just drove over the border or have flown into uh, Manchester or Liverpool and then um, driven over the borders in order to visit uh, Wales for a few days. Um, and as you, I, I think you mentioned it, one of your one of your um, uh, study uh, statistics earlier, a lot of our US citizens use it as access point to go then to Ireland. So it's also, again, a combination tour. And I think um, the, I, I combine it, I, I compare it always a little bit when you when you speak, I'm German. When you speak about Germany, everyone thinks about a giant glass of beer, which is very typical for Bavaria. Bavaria has been amazing outside in the world promoting themselves, whereby the rest of Germany, I mean, where I'm from, Cologne, we have very small glasses. So everyone is really surprised when they come to other parts of Germany and have really small beer glasses. And I compare this a little bit to Wales. Wales has been very almost shy in shouting how amazing Wales is. And when you look at what Wales has to order, uh, to offer in terms of history, culture, food and drink, uh, nature, the coastline is fantastic. Um, I think most people in the world would have no, no clue and no idea what Wales has to offer. And that has been our experience. Whenever we've spoken to clients, it's almost like you have a first touch conversation with the clients, if, if that makes sense. So Claire and I had pulled together a uh, beginning of 2020, a detailed activity plan, what we wanted to achieve in order to promote Wales through our channels, because we have the warm contacts in the source markets. But unfortunately, the pandemic um, didn't allow us to roll any of that out, really. Yeah. Um, uh, Adam, I mean, just out of interest, what's your experience in selling Wales in, in Asian markets? I mean, was there anything in particular that was popular? Um, yeah, first I, I should perhaps point out I'm not the greatest expert on Wales. I, I am a quarter Welsh um, and we used to holiday in the early days in Abersock in uh, northwest Wales. But uh, obviously uh, Mickey uh, is a global operator. We, we deal with FITs, as I said, globally uh, in the group segment. Uh, it's predominantly Japanese and more latterly uh, a lot of Asian groups from China, Indonesia, Thailand, etc. And um, so we deal with, uh, for groups, we deal with uh, the land arrangement for the whole of Europe. Uh, obviously, UK is one of the uh, most popular destinations countries there. It's not the number one uh, for either of these markets. Uh, Italy, France tend to be uh, the top two. But UK, we've focused a lot on UK over the last few years very successfully. And obviously, in conjunction with that, uh, Scotland, Ireland, Wales all, all have come very much into focus. And we've obviously been trying to diversify, as someone mentioned, I think it was, uh, it was Claire in her presentation, spreading the business, spreading the markets, uh, seasonality, etc., is all very important. So for us, yes, we've certainly uh, uh, looked at, uh, at these destinations, uh, including Wales, how we can diversify. Um, 
up to now, um, I think we've had generally good feedback, but admittedly, it's relatively small. I think the Asia uh, segment accounted for about 10 or 11 percent, if I remember correctly, from the stats. Um, but our success to date has been very much uh, similar to what's been mentioned previously, um, uh, often arriving into Cardiff um, and doing some sightseeing, etc., in Cardiff, and of course uh, the northern part. Uh, Conway is uh, particularly popular in the Japanese market. Uh, I believe it's twinned the castle there with Him Himeji Castle in Japan. Um, so there are uh, connections there. and. Uh, We've certainly seen a, a lot of interest over the years uh, in, in Conwy uh, and that, uh, that area in Landodno. A little bit uh, Snowdonia and uh, Brecon Beacons, um, but uh, you know, Conwy uh, and Cardiff have, have really been the, the prime destinations. And most of those, uh, or many of them for the Japanese, certainly they've, they've been coming in and staying very often uh, in Chester. Uh, which we'll perhaps get into a, a little bit more in a bit shortly, but due to the problems of accommodation uh, in, in the northern part of Wales, I think that that's been the biggest drawback. Um, but we have had a, a degree of, uh, of success um, with this, and uh, we very much tried to engage uh, with uh, you know, uh, the local entities, you know, Visit Wales, obviously in this case, and some of the other, in the other nations. Uh, and I think uh, studying the product uh, available, uh, engaging with the agents to, to build new uh, itineraries, I think very much from over the last two or three years, going back obviously pre-COVID, what we were hearing very much from our customers in Japan, and by customers I mean the travel agents in both Japan and the rest of Asia, was that their, their clients were very much looking for new experiences new destinations and new experiences. So um, a lot of the sort of grand tour of just doing the capitals, uh, that a lot of that's been achieved by people now, and they're, they're certainly looking for something different in terms of where they visit and what they do once they get there. And I think uh, for a more of a, a niche market like Wales, I think one of the critical things is uh, engaging with the right uh, travel agents in Japan. And I think that's where the, uh, the, uh, the operator's role is vital. Um, you, you could go and make a sale, a very expensive sales call, for example, to somewhere like Japan and see some ma major travel agents, but potentially have very little business uh, arising from that. Um, you know, there are key agents like uh, um, uh, Was World Air Service and ANA Hello Tours, and uh, they very much focus on uh, repeat business, uh, very often uh, slightly older clientele, uh, slightly more, uh, more you know, financially well off and therefore with more uh, money to spend. And they are particularly uh, very often smaller groups, eight, ten rooms, which I think again lends itself to the situation that, uh, that we face in, in Northern Wales in particular. So I think that focusing on the, the agents that target the right clientele, I think is uh, particularly important with a, with a destination with limited uh, hotel capacity, uh, as in North Wales especially. Oh, th th thank you, Adam. I think it was really interesting how you um, uh, placed it in the context of uh, a European inbound offer when it comes to the Far East. Uh, the first thing they see is Europe as a region. Uh, then they're thinking, you know, should we go to Italy? Should we go to France? Should we go to the UK? And Wales it has to fit itself in within that product offer. It, and um, at the moment, it's as Vera has said, it's, it's not easy uh, to get your voice heard, it's been, particularly if you're underappreciated and under-recognised. Uh, but within the context of trying to fit yourself in between the uh, people looking at Paris or Venice or Rome or, or Switzerland, um, it's, a, um, it's a doable feat, but it's a, you, you, you managed to uh, show quite how big the, the task is to get, to get Wales known and recognised in these markets. Yeah, but I think there are, we'll go perhaps into that a little bit more later on, but there are opportunities, as I said, I think people are looking for something somewhere different, um, yeah. you know, something, you know, something new, 
And uh, I think uh, I don't have any stats, but uh, I, I would I would guess that the uh, satisfaction uh, rating of uh, first-time visitors to Wales from whether it be the Far East or other parts of the world is, is relatively high. I think uh, once they're there, they enjoy what Wales has to offer. Um, but for example, in our case as a, as a tour operator, um, the decision is made by the travel agents in Japan and Asia. So we have to engage with them. We have to suggest new itineraries. We have to suggest a product or somewhere you know, where to stay, a manor house hotel or whatever that can uh, make that uh, itinerary more appealing. But it's up to them uh, to then uh, agree with that and invest in uh, promoting it, etc. Right. Um I, I, I'm just intrigued. I mean, we've touched on difficulties. I think it might be worthwhile uh, dwelling on those just for a few moments. Uh, Vera, are there any particular difficulties you encounter when you're trying to sell Wales? What are the big obstacles? I, I think, I mean, you mentioned, you mentioned um, accommodation already, which I think is very crucial if you organise a tour and want people to stay for longer than just for a short stint. They need to stay somewhere overnight. Um, and whether that's um, small B&Bs for individual travellers or smaller hotels or whether it's bigger hotels for a uh, group business. Um, and now with the ICC in, in Newport, I mean, obviously there might be a few more hotels around there for bigger groups. But if you want people to stay in Wales, I think accommodation is a, is a key point. Access point is another one. Um, I mean, you have some airports surrounding. I mean, you have an airport in Cardiff, but which, inter I mean, which international airline is going there? Um, then, I mean, it's it's good always to understand if you want a certain source markets, they need to get somehow to Wales. Or you have in the north, you have Manchester, for example, as access point, which is very useful as well, just to, to name a few. Um, I think when I joined Joss and Claire at this conference, I think it was three years ago, correct me if I'm wrong, Claire. Um, <laughs> I lost track of time. Um, I, I think it's very important to understand how the trade works because, I mean, for us and how the booking patterns work. So looking at Germany as an example, um, in normal times, the booking patterns are about a year and a half before arrival, they would book their trip, but they can cancel everything up to a month before arrival. So I think there's obviously there's a risk carriage in there, but I think we need to obviously find a way how we partner with each other, how the promotional cycle works some of these big german or other markets like france italy big two operators they produce brochures yearly so you need to ensure that you're in that brochure because otherwise you will not be sold um i think these are challenges and we found that a lot of the businesses we've spoken to and this is not spoken to and it's not only wales it's also other parts in the uk are a bit overwhelmed with how to work with the trade and how a commission model works or or something like it and i think claire and her team as well as visit britain have done a great job starting to educate and to speak to suppliers to really say this is how you need to structure your price model as an example this is how you can work with the trade this is how it works um other than that i think um it's our job and i wouldn't call this as as a negative thing it's our job if we we package a tour we give idea give us out into the market so that's our job and i think the the product or the supplier don't even need to do much about this anymore maybe support us with more information about their product and maybe images or something like it but the rest would sit with us it's just like um i think it's a hand in hand approach really um yes, and in, in addition sorry um i felt that we as dmcs have not been much included so some suppliers tried to do their own promotions but it went, was maybe a lot of effort and great promotions as well but they went into nowhere because they didn't have the right channels to use and I think we've seen this in in the rest of Britain right now and in the UK right now where we've started to really partner up and I think we will show the, um, the results of this will be much stronger obviously because you, you think with one voice and go together strongly out there because for a client wherever in the world or for a customer they don't understand how all this is structured. They arrive here and see a country, so they don't know who is involved and how. They just want to go there and have a seamless experience. And I think the more it is important that we give that to them. Thank you. Hmm. So thank you, Vera. I mean, what, what difficulties, did you encounter any difficulties, Adam? 
I think uh, initially, of course, uh, um, you know, there is probably a, still a certain lack of knowledge. Um, so I think that's the first barrier. It's uh, it's vital that uh, the the promotion, the general promotion of Wales as a, as a destination, and then the various regions uh, uh, is is brought, you know, higher into people's uh, the travel agents' conscious uh, consciousness uh, consciousness. I think. So I mean, I, you know, understanding the the market, the product, what it has to offer, I think is critical. But on a more practical level, as I touched on earlier, for us, uh, uh, Cardiff is no, has been generally no problem with regards to accommodation. But as soon as you try and, and, and place the groups in northern Wales, particularly in, in Conway and that area, then it, it's really challenging. Um, you know, there are not many uh, hotels large enough to take reasonable size groups and uh, a lot of the Asian groups tend to be of, of a reasonable size, you know, 20 rooms, for example, not, not six, eight, ten rooms. Um, and so there's a general sort of lack of availability. And then on top of that, um, of course, you're competing uh, with the domestic market um, and uh, the domestic market in, in summer is very strong and that's when uh, a lot of the uh, Asian groups want to travel as well. Uh, in winter, you know, a certain amount of closed, of course, but uh, um, so it, it's availability, but also the actual conditions, you know, understandably, depending on the nature of the property, they're looking to protect themselves. Um, I mean, Vera just mentioned, I mean, the, uh, the Japanese and a lot of the Asian markets actually book quite late. Uh, we, we reserve the hotels quite early, but the actual customers book quite late. And again, they can cancel, you know, uh, historically, they can cancel up to one month uh, prior. Um, so these conditions are, are quite, uh, quite, you know, if, if hotels, for example, are requiring um, deposits or non-refundable deposits quite early, that's a real challenge for the operator. So um, I think general availability and the conditions that understandably they seek to protect themselves with, these throw up and, and represent barriers to, to the tour operators. And uh, we've historically found that one of the biggest problems in trying to place business in, in Northern Wales. Yeah, I, I, think, I think the point you're making um, really has to be emphasized. Um, both the scheduled operators, those are the people who um, put together programs and print them in brochures or used to print them in brochures, uh, advertise them on the uh, web um, and run, for instance, group tours on a regular basis. They will be planning their 2020. Most of their plans for 2023 will already be well advanced, um, and they're about to go out and place the bookings for 2023 in the forthcoming months. Indeed, the event that um, Just and I are putting on at the Britain and Ireland Marketplace at the end of January um, uh, is partly there to um, enable those tour operators who are putting programs together to place their 2023 business. Um, and so that's the planning cycle you're looking at. Um, I think from a, um, speaking from a, a, a slightly superannuated North American operator, which is what I, what I was many years ago, it's really, it was really interesting. We were looking at, could we do a Wales tour? We did Scotland tours, we did Germany tours, we did tours in the Netherlands. Um, could we do one of Wales? And the answer is, we couldn't really do one of Wales. So if we were doing a tour of Wales, we couldn't do it in Wales. We were basically uh, driving up through Wales and then staying in, in England, which is where the hotel accommodation was, particularly for um, uh, Central Wales and North Wales. And this is something that sort of hampers the brand image. Now, I know, Claire, you've been listening to the, us harping on. I don't know if you want to reply um, to any of this. I'll hand, you over, hand over to you for a minute and then over to Joss, perhaps. Um, Claire, is there anything happening on that front? Yeah, thanks, Tom. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, we've we've actually seen um, a, a sort of heartening um, amount of uh, product development continue um, in spite of COVID. Um, so, you know, for example, um, we had a, a new hotel open up last year, the Hilton uh, Garden Inn in, in Snowdonia. Um, there are other, you know, sort of smaller scale um, developments, more boutique developments that are, have gone on in North Wales. And we're also seeing in the south, um, we've got uh, new 
hotels opening for groups. So, um, for example, next year, the, the um, Celtic Collection, which is affiliated with the Celtic Manor uh, Resort, which many of you will know, they have a, a, a brand called Tea Hotels and they're opening um, a tea uh, Milford Waterfront Hotel next next year in, in Pembrokeshire. Um, and the, the tea brand specifically is, is designed to cater for groups. Now, still, we're talking about the South of Wales, I know, um, with, with that, that particular one. They, they've also opened recently the Parkgate Hotel in Cardiff. There are other um, developments coming um, in New, Newport as well. Um, as you say, um, I think both both Vera and Adam, you you know, really I think highlighted one of the biggest challenges is is up in North Wales, um, where you know it it it's uh, you know where um, access in and out, as you say, from places like Chester and and Liverpool does make that perhaps as things stand more attractive. But we obviously. Um, you know, for us, it's very much about in, increasing the, the bed nights in Wales because the more, you know, the, the more that people stay over here, then the more can be programmed in around, around the stays. So it's not only the, you know, the, the impact from an economic point of view, but it's the fact that we can showcase more of, of the destination. Um, and it, you know, we've we've got a, a brand new world heritage site, the Slate Landscape of North Wales, which takes in, you know, the best part of Snowdonia, really. Um, so that you know, we've we've got some great products um, to promote and and sell. Um, so you know, I think Vera, you you mentioned um, the importance of partnership, and I think. You know, we very much see it as as an opportunity for us to work together to to try and um, I think you know bring back um, certainly the the opportunity for inbound tourism because you know inevitably um, that's not been where things have been in the last couple of years. Um, but we would we would really you know like to see more opportunity for international visitors coming in and, and to work with. Our supplier base here, um, including, you know, the the destination management companies and inbound operators that we have um, in Wales, as well as um, companies, you know, like Vera and, and Adams, to to really um, get that pipeline back up and and back up and running, really. Um, but yeah, you know, certainly there are opportunities for for developers. Um, and you know, hopefully, perhaps the opening of some of these other hotels will show others that that there is an opportunity here. Um, so, uh, yeah. Can I throw in just one additional comment there on the, uh, with regards to uh, you know when they stay in, for example, Chester or Liverpool, you you then open up the, the issue of the drivers' hours as well. Because obviously, if they're coming in from outside, coming up from Cardiff or in the south, or they're coming in from Chester, whatever, they're already consuming some of the necessary driving hours. So that's one additional problem. And the other one, just going very briefly, going back to the hotel accommodation, uh, in many Asian countries now, they have quite stringent travel laws. So uh, it's really necessary once the, uh, the wholesaler or operators provide the name of the hotel, they have to stick to it. Otherwise, the, the penalties can be quite punitive. So that makes it more difficult when you're dealing with smaller, more limited accommodation. I, I think I think this is probably the principal barrier that we're we're facing. I, just to give a slightly different twist on it, I mean, uh, what's noticeable has been actually the increasing use of Wales um, by those people who are travelling through to get to Ireland. Um, when I started many years ago, um, uh, it was basically a sprint across Wales from uh, Bath or Bristol to, to get over um, to Fishguard or vice versa. And similarly, coming from Chester to get to Holyhead, you, you, you couldn't hang around, uh, but with the advances in the A55, people now are able to stop in Conway. Um, uh, they are actually able even to stop in Carnarvon en route uh, to Holyhead. And this means that, you know, there is money being spent there, um, uh, if, not, uh, if not bed nights. 
And similarly, I mean, we've seen a real rise in Cardiff being an alternative accommodation venue to Bath and Bristol, to those people traveling through that area. So things are improving on that front. But I think just to quote, just to echo what um, Adam is saying, um, what, what we need are, are hotels that um, are largely reliant on corporate customers who are happy to take one night or two night bookings. If you've got people who are wholly reliant on leisure bookings, they're really looking for people to spend a week there. And that's a pretty tall order for, um, certainly for escorted group tours, to have a week long booking in, in a hotel. It very, very rarely occurs. Um, Joss, I don't know if you've got an angle on this as to what difficulties you perceive that might be overcome. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, Wales has got absolutely what international visitors to the UK want. <clears throat> a lot of the time, as Vera says, the problem is, is that they don't know about it. You know, Wales has got the experiences, people are moving much more towards experiential tourism where they can participate in local culture. They feel that they're in a different place, different to England, but different to where they come from. So I think some of it is around getting, <clears throat> excuse me, the Wales brand out there. Now, a lot of the time when you do brand marketing, that costs so much money because you're talking about TV, you're talking about print, you're talking about radio, cinema, or video on demand, all of those. But I think where Wales has a good advantage over other parts in England is the fact that you have Visit Wales on your side. You have a professional team in terms of Claire who's working with these operators on a day-to-day -day basis. Again, we heard earlier, I think it was from Vera, I know it might have been from Adam actually that you know making sales calls yourself to go out to these overseas markets when you're not necessarily going with bookable packaged product may not deliver the returns that you want so working closely with through Claire and through the Visit Wales team and directly with the Veras and the Adams of this world that's uh, Vera said she deals with 40 different source markets you have a contract with tour partner group you know, that's 40 markets that you don't have to visit, much as potentially you might quite like to as individuals. From a return on investment perspective, getting Vera and getting Adam to do that work of selling in your product into the destination is an ideal way to get the route to market. I think the other challenge, and we, you know, we spent a lot of time talking about the availability of accommodation here. I just one word of caution is, is that it was in November that people around the globe started to think less about domestic tourism and more about international tourism. Now, from an inbound perspective, that's good because people are looking to come to the UK. But also a word of caution is that those people are so heavily reliant upon English or domestic business may well be looking to travel internationally this year and maybe they haven't been doing that in 2020 or 2021. So do keep your portfolio as balanced as you can by having international somewhere within that mix, because these are the people that are spending three times on an overnight trip than domestic visitors do as well. Uh, so I guess key message would be partnership. We've heard it before, work in partnership with Visit Wales, but also partnership with the operators, because yes, you will have to pay a commission, but that if you don't sell anything, you don't pay the commission anyway. Uh, it allows you to manage your business at the times of year that you need it with the types of customers that are going to be bringing in that high value spend that you and the local areas are going to be needing as well. So I think kind of partnership and working with and through Visit Wales would be my key messages, Tom. Thank you. Well, very well put. Now, I'm just going to put um, Adam and uh, Vera on the spot very quickly. Uh, what, you know, what do you think the big opportunity for Wales is in the forthcoming um, forthcoming years and look over a five year period. And I suppose allied to that is, uh, or related to that, is what would you do if you were a Welsh supplier? How would you go about selling yourselves? I think Joss has partly answered that question, but I mean, if you've, um, I mean, what would you know, what would you do if you were uh, um, uh, an attraction in central Wales? How, how would you go about uh, getting yourself uh, on people's agenda? Vera, why don't you start while Adam well, is-, is Well, more, I, I more mean, Joss stole, just stole some of my words already, but thank you for that. <laughs> but I, I think he would be, I mean, make use of us. I mean, we are here. I mean, it's like when I joined the conference with Claire together and Joss a couple of years ago. I mean, 
I'm happy to have conversations. I mean, our product team is happy to have conversations and also giving advice and there's no charge or anything for it. That's why we're sitting in the same boat. I mean, we are very excited and happy if we have amazing products to sell. Um, and I, I think what is really important as well, I mean, to understand what product actually do you have to sell and then maybe get some advice of how you can sell it and what you maybe need to do in order to sell it internationally. Um, but also understanding the source markets you are catering to and setting your own expectations, right? I mean, for example, a US client would potentially not stay a week and beach holiday in, or very sure will not stay a week at a beach holiday in, in Wales. They ideally want to tick off as many countries they can on one trip. They come for two or three weeks and then they might do uh, Wales uh, and they see every everything as an individual country. They do Wales, England, Scotland, Ireland, and then maybe hop over to, to Paris, um, Germany, and some other markets just to say when they come back, oh, we've been to 14 countries. Um, but I think the key message is there, if you have a German, for example, they would maybe stay three, four days if they have accommodation and they have availability to stay in that area. So I think um, thinking about who you're targeted to, but also do you want to promote to individual travelers or do you want to cater for a group? Then you obviously need to have a different different offering. Um, understanding the different buying cycles. When are, when are source markets buying? When are, I mean, when do you need to engage with a DMC or a tour operator in order to get your product out? Um, and I, I think what Josh said as well, I mean, it, it doesn't need to be straight through us. I work very closely with Claire. I work very close with Stephen in the US, for example. I, I think we, we can also channel the communication. We can host webinars for you in order to explain how we work as a first step, maybe. Um, and I, I think the, it, the product in, in Wales or what Wales has to offer, and that's what I see as a prediction, I think it's actually what the entire world is talking about right now. You have nature, so you have fresh air, which is in COVID times even more important than ever. You have an absolute, and I repeat myself right now, an absolute fantastic coastline. Um, you have beautiful food and drinks. You have unique experiences which you which you can do, which a lot of people are, especially the ex experimental experiences right now. Um, you have history. You have, I mean, I stayed in i sorry for my pronunciation, Roch Castle in Pembrokeshire. That was maybe totally off. Sorry about that. Um, and it's like a fantastic experience. You stay in a castle overnight. I mean, it's more a unique individual traveler product, but there is accommodation for that. That kind of clientele is there. And they have done a great job being a bit more present out there. So they're very active on social media. They're very active, but you need to obviously have the right client base on social media as well. Otherwise it goes into nowhere. Um, attending trade shows, sales calls have been mentioned a few times. And I mean, there's no harm if you have budget to spend to join some of our teams on a sale call, develop a product together or an itinerary together where you're featured and then go out together and present. But it can also be done by through a uh, visit Wales, for example, if Claire or one of her team, Judith, for example, could come on trips and present a bigger portfolio of products, for example, what Wales has to offer. I think for us, it's not a new way of working. We have done, we have a lot of experiences working with Visit Britain, Visit Scotland, Tourism Island or others in the world. Um, and I think I think I'm just the offer is out there. Make use of us. We're here. And I think I speak on Adam's behalf as well, but I'll let you speak now, Adam. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, I would echo much of what you've just said there, Vera. Um, I think just to add, though, I do think there's uh, there are opportunities now and that timing, uh, as in most things in life, is, is, is crucial. And um, as Joss jo touched on, um, you know, the staycations, uh, popularity, uh, I, my guess is that next summer will still be quite strong. But gradually, as things develop, then uh, the Brits will seek to go abroad again. And this will open up uh, availability uh, much more for international travellers. But the problem is if you wait too long, uh, once the business does, does start to recover, then you'll find the operators with their depleted resources will find it very difficult to go into uh, promote uh, invest uh, strategy. They'll be hands on um, you know, operating. So I think that that work has probably got to be done now so that it can bear fruit uh, you know, over the next uh, couple of years. Um, timing, timing I, do, I do think it is critical. 
and again i'd echo you know the uh, um, the coastline a lot of outdoor activities uh, i mean the, the japanese for example like trekking you've got snowdonia for, for walks etc so i think there's a there's a lot that can appeal um, and I think it's obviously working you in a very fortunate to have the resource with Visit Wales, uh, including representation in, in, in some of these overseas areas. And uh, you have to use those to maximum effect. But I think there are opportunities now combined with what I said earlier, that uh, agents and customers are looking for new destinations and new experiences. So, uh, you know, it's difficult. Resource is very stretched, but it's all about investing at the right time, I think. No, I, I would just echo what you said, and just to re-echo what I was saying earlier. And what you've got is unique in Wales, uh, but it's um, you have got competition, particularly for some of those things which are your lead products. Um, there, there are no doubt that um, people will be attracted to go trekking in Wales. They will be attracted by the coastline, but um, there are other destinations with coastlines, such as Scandinavia, chiefly Norway, and other destinations with trekking, such as Switzerland. Um, which may feature larger, may loom larger in the imagination of your potential clients. So you've got to find a way of making what you do unique and uniquely attractive. Um, and this is something that I know uh, Claire will be working on quite hard. Um, Claire, is there any final word you would like to say? Um, really, just to say, Dilk and Barry, um, thank you very much, um, you know, both to um, Tom, and Joss um, for uh, collaborating with us over many, many years, and, and Vera and, and Adam likewise, along with all of the other um, operators, DMCs, and uh, representatives of the, the travel trade that are, are so you know, vitally important for us in terms of inbound um, international tourism. And, um, you know, we really, you know, we appreciate that it's, it's been a very very difficult couple of years and you know continues to be challenging but hopefully by working together and with our supplier base in wales and you know showing them the way really that that there is an opportunity here that if we work together we can actually make the best of that opportunity for wales and you know we really look forward to doing that um in the year and, and years ahead so uh thank you very much Okay, and uh, thank you, Claire. Um, I would just emphasize that um, this uh, webinar has been recorded. It's going to be available on the website. You can source it through the Britain and Ireland uh, Marketplace website, I'm sure. Don't forget that all the virtues of talking to tour operators, uh, talking to intermediaries, is encapsulated in BIM, which is both going to be in person, we trust, we hope, to be in person at the end of January, uh, but it will also be online, and so there will definitely be an online version as well as an in-person version. Um, but everything you heard today has been recorded, and including, of course, all the slide decks that were presented at the beginning. So if you want to review them again, you can do so. Um, I would like to take this opportunity uh, because when this uh, uh, seminar is over, it shuts down very quickly and I don't have any other scope to say thank you. I'd like to say a heartfelt thank you to my co-panelists, Vera, Joss, Claire and Adam, who've given up their time uh, today to discuss these points. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, audience, as well. I appreciate we've had um, nearly everybody who joined at the beginning has stayed right through to the bitter end. So that's um, that, that says a lot for your uh, stamina. Uh, let alone our presentation. Uh, just one last thought. I would say that um, notwithstanding some of the um, traps that are laid for us by government and indeed by by fate and, and disease, when I was talking to um, my members in North America um, last week, uh, they said that there were some people there who said that the bookings they had on their, um, uh, the bookings they'd received so far meant that 2022 looked even better than 2019. There is huge appetite for um, travel, particularly in the United States. And if we can allow these people to come over here, I know they will come and come in numbers. And what they're looking for is they are, yes, they're looking to tick off bucket lists, as Vera said, but they're also looking 
uh, for experiences. And experience, experiential holidays is a rather unfelicitous phrase, but they, an exp unique experience is exactly what Wales can offer these people. So there's every grounds to be optimistic next year, as long as the secret police of our desires, which is Omicron, does not come and destroy it for us. With that thought, um, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much indeed. Thank you, panellists. Thank you for being here. Have a very happy Christmas. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Happy Christmas, happy everyone. Happy Christmas, everyone. Merry Christmas. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.